you know you what, what's happening i don't know someone says shot fire i had uh, two tries two tries Greenland, the largest island in the world, an ice desert at the mercy of the ocean, lashed by arctic winds, populated by seals and polar bears, where time seems to have stopped flowing. But beyond that, what do we really know about Greenland? We came here with very specific purposes, to dispel hard-to-die myths, to tell you the parable of an inhospitable land shaped by colonial domination that aspires to be a nation. To show you how this is not just a white spot drawn on a map, but rather a part of our history as human beings. Welcome to Greenland. Nel 1982, l'esploratore norreno Eric il Rosso, esiliato dall'Islanda dopo aver commesso un omicidio, viaggiò verso ovest e approdò in una vallata rigogliosa. La chiamò Groenland, la terra verde. Tra il 1985 e l'anno 1000 furono in centinaia gli islandesi che decisero di attraversare l'oceano per stanziarvisi assieme al proprio bestiame. For nearly four centuries, settlers traded walrus tusks and seal skins with Iceland and Norway in exchange for food wood and iron tools. At the time, however, the Norse villages in Greenland were already falling into ruin. Within a few decades, nothing more was known of the inhabitants. The Crown of Copenhagen, interested in keeping the Arctic trade routes active and hunting whales, in order to undermine the then Dutch competition, tried to re-establish contacts with the lost colony. 300 years of inconclusive expeditions followed until, in 1721, the Lutheral pastor Hans Egede landed where the first Danish settlement in Greenland would be born, Gutob, Good Hope. Questa casa gialla e rossa che vedete alle mie spalle è presumibilmente una delle prime case che furono costruite ai primi del Settecento in Groenlandia. Apparteneva ad Hans Egede, che fu appunto l'uomo mandato dalla corona danese per avviare il processo di cristianizzazione sull'isola. Since 1979, Gutob has been renamed Nook, which means Cape, and it's the capital of Greenland. At that time, Egede believed not only that he would meet survivors, but also that these, having been isolated for centuries, still preached Catholicism or paganism, and that they spoke as some form of Old Norse. Egede was wrong. The Greenland coasts had now become home to another people, the Inuit. The term Inuit in the singular Inuk, means people and has replaced the derogatory and erroneous Eskimos, which means those who wear snowshoes. These Arctic people descend from the first Siberian men who migrated over the millennia to the northern areas of Alaska, Canada and Greenland, and have always lived by fishing and hunting animals, such as polar bears, seals, reindeer and whales. Today, 90% of Greenlanders are Inuit, and largely speak the Kalatlisut language, which is completely different from the European ones. In some villages, like in Tazilak on the east coast, the Inuit have never abandoned their roots. We live uh, with my mother and father. You fish and hunt uh, for a living? Yeah, now uh, I'm hunting for a living. In the summer, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a boat driver with a tourist. Your uh, work? Is it shared with other people here? Chao? In the town mm -hmm. you're the only one? No. No, okay. Many. There are many. Many, hunter, okay. hunter, yeah. Thule, the most direct ancestors of the Inuit, penetrated southwest Greenland around the 14th century. There is when the Nordic Atlantic area was hit by a phenomenon climate known as the Little Ice Age, which is believed to have caused the disappearance of the Norse colonies. In Gutob, Egede's mission was to convert the locals, which were perceived as savages. It was a slow process, hindered by the presence of the Angakuit, the so-called Inuit shamans, who were seen as holders of knowledge in both the religion and medical fields. However, the Danes began to populate the western coast, expanded Gutob and founded the harbour of Jakobsaun, the modern Iluriset. With the creation of the Royal Greenlandic Company in 1774, Copenhagen established a monopoly aimed at acquiring, in exchange for coffee and tobacco, meat, leather and handicraft products, including tupilek, bone statuettes depicting demons from Inuit mythology. Thus, by changing perspective, 
the Inuit began to deprive themselves of resources that had always been necessary to their subsistence and access Western market logic. This trend was frowned upon by Danish officials who feared that the Inuits would soon lose their essence and therefore their usefulness. Furthermore, in 1814 Denmark was forced to cede Norway to Sweden after being defeated in the Napoleonic Wars and to rely only on the Icelandic and Greenlandic colonies. Then the presumed desire to preserve the Inuit culture was accompanied by the need to make it more efficient. In 1835, the Royal Company suggested building wooden houses to replace the traditional Inuit homes. There is huts and summer tents made of bones and fabrics. Although famous, the igloos were nothing more than shelters used for hunting and fishing. And although it is redundant to underline it, no, no single Inuk still lives in the igloos. In 1856, the colonial administrators decreed that each settlement would have to elect its own representatives in charge of supervising the society. However, only the most experienced hunters could carry out this task. In other words, the royal company delegitimized the Angakuit, the shamans, and destabilized a proven social structure. The same thing happened when Denmark decided to claim Greenland in its entirety. Escluso l'entroterra ghiacciato, rimanevano da colonizzare la costa est e l'area nord. Nel 1885 i danesi arrivarono ad Ammassalik, l'isola dove sorge l'odierna Tasilak, e dieci anni dopo la inclusero nel progetto coloniale. Più avanti, Copenaghen inviò un'altra spedizione nel nord dell'isola, dove nel 1910 fondò la stazione Thule. Shortly thereafter, the advancement of European claims on the Arctic routes and the outbreak of the two world wars would have made Greenland geostrategic potential evident. In 1941, with Copenhagen occupied by the Nazi army, the Danish ambassador to Washington, Henry Kaufman, allowed the United States to establish five temporary military bases on the island. These gave an important tactical advantage to the Allied Air Force. However, once the conflict was over, the White House didn't give up. In fact, the United States aspired to exploit the island for an anti-Soviet purpose and to take possession of cryolite, a mineral useful for the manufacture of aluminium present on the south coast. In great secrecy, in 1951, American engineers began to build a gigantic air base in Thule, still operating today. In 1968, the crash of an American fighter caused the dispersion of four tactical thermonuclear bombs, which exploded and contaminated the entire Thule area. One of the four warheads is still missing today, but two years before this incident, Washington had decommissioned another secret base, Camp Century, which was supposed to host 600 nuclear missiles capable of reaching Moscow. These US military projects forced the local Inuit communities to move even 100 kilometers away. At the same time, the noise and the clangs of the machines irreparably affected the ecosystems that had until then been immersed in silence. In any case, Greenland's most important resource still remains the sea. How many hours do you spend uh, on the boat? We don't know. Sometimes uh, 10 hours, sometimes 4 hours, sometimes only 2 two hours. Even in the winter? Uh, now, in the winter, we used to be dog sl sleep. Okay. Yeah. Already in the first half of the 20th century in Copenhagen, they had noticed how the fishing of shrimp, halibut, cod and salmon could generate much greater profits than those deriving from traditional seal or reindeer hunting. In 1953, driven by decolonization, the Danish government elevated Greenland to the status of an autonomous province. Over the course of 20 years, Copenhagen launched two development plans called G50 and G60, aimed at modernizing the island's fishing industry and settlements. These welfare policies have certainly improved the quality of Greenlandic life. My name is Robert Perone. E sono alto artesino e vivo qui da ormai 25-26 anni. E sono venuto qui già 43 anni fa e sono rimasto colpito da questo popolo e da questa bellissima natura. In tutti questi anni quanto è cambiata Tassilac? E prima non c'era niente, non avevo neanche telefono, avevamo proprio niente di niente, eravamo su un'isola proprio lontana dal, dal mondo. Despite its obvious advantages, modernization brought about much larger and more sudden upheavals than those suffered previously. 
the abolition of the monopoly of the Royal Greenland Company and the construction of new port facilities removed the social role of the hunter, who until 50 years earlier, colonial officials had considered the pinnacle of Inuk society. To guarantee greater productivity of the locals now employed in the fish factories, the urbanization projects involved the forced movement of thousands of people from the villages to the new urban centers inhabited, this time equipped with shops, schools and hospitals. Apart from barracks and wooden buildings, Nook is today the emblem of an accelerated development that doesn't take into consideration the lifestyle of the Inuits. Just think of the so-called Block P, an abnormal ghetto residential structure built in the 60s, now demolished, which was said to contain 1% of the entire Greenlandic population. Thanks to the opportunities that opened up on the island, Inuits found themselves busy with tasks they had never done before. However, they were paid 25% less than Danes in the same positions. To earn an equivalent salary, an Inuk had to have lived at least 10 years in Denmark. Economic discrimination went hand in hand with some perverse intentions. In 1951, the Danish authorities took 22 Inuit children away from their families to send them to Denmark and train them as the future Greenlandic ruling class. This experiment, needless to say, failed. Half of those children died at a young age, and half were affected by mental disorders. Between the 60s and 70s, under government directives, Danish doctors placed intrauterine coils, contraceptive instruments, in the bodies of approximately 4,000 Inuit women and girls. In doing so, in just a few years, the Greenlandic birth rate, considered excessively high at the time, was halved. The criticism and discontent towards the entire post-colonial system led to the birth of the Autonomous Parliament of Nuuk in 1979. Greenland chose its current flag in 1985, the same year it left the European Economic Community to protect its waters from the probable siege of foreign fishing boats. In fact, today Greenland is not part of the European Union and has enjoyed an autonomous government since 2009. Nonetheless, the fate of the largest island in the world is undefined. According to the United Nations, Greenlandic society suffers from the lack of adequate housing and healthcare facilities. It suffers from an educational system that allows young people to emancipate themselves. There are so many young people who don't see the future yet, but they don't want the past. It's a very interesting passage, but it's very difficult to them, very difficult for them. In 2014, the Nuuk government created a reconciliation commission in order to heal relations with Denmark. It will be a long process that will require the acquisition of greater awareness both on the part of the Inuit community and the Danish authorities. Myself, having lived here for nearly one and a half years, I've only experienced like one episode of a drunk person coming up and saying I should go back where I came from. Uh, I've heard other stories where people got confronted during a night out or at a concert, also being asked to go home. But I would say, like in general, people I meet are very open and honest. That's the thing about Greenlandic people. The wounds of the colonial period, perhaps, have never healed. Did you hear shotgun shots yes. over there? Yeah. Okay. Two times. Two times. Yes. So they are calling the police. Okay, so I don't, I don't need to go there. No. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you. Okay. Um, praticamente mi stavo dirigendo laggiù e i passanti che stanno facendo la salita mi hanno sconsigliato di andare laggiù perché hanno sentito colpi di pistola almeno due volte. E il primo passante che mi ha fermato mi ha detto non andare laggiù perché sono ubriachi e hanno cominciato a, a, a sparare. Sorry. Shot fire. Okay, so go away, we, oui. okay, we should go. Okay. Hi, Aaron, hi, yeah. hi, hi. You know, you, what, what's happening? I don't know. Someone says shot fire. I had uh, two twice. Two twice? Two twice. 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 Two What's happening? He still have a gun. He still have a gun. Okay. È è una situazione veramente surreale questa. The lower social classes, I think most of the stuff that I experience, alcoholism is a big problem. Like the social evolution kind of happened too fast, so to speak. 
uh, a lot of people lost their jobs because they had to be moved out of the smaller cities into like Nuuk. Uh, there are like a couple of, uh, I think we call them the blocks. Mm. At the, you can't really see them here, but like where people got lodged in together. And I think forcing a person who his whole life has gone fishing, gone hunting to suddenly work at a factory is kind of soul sucking in a weird way. Yeah. I could imagine that and also having access to alcohol kind of messed a lot of people up, I would imagine. The issues of Greenlandic society do not end here at all. And now, more than ever, in a 21st century marked by uncertainty and competition between global powers, Greenland is destined to deal with the inevitability of the future and its challenges, its opportunities. But we will talk more about this in the next video. Questa distesa di ghiaccio che vedete nel giro di poche decine di anni potrebbe scomparire completamente e diventare acqua.